Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this Brookings event. Good morning. I'm Mike O'Hanlon from the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. I'm joined by my colleagues Ben Bernanke and Mark Muro. Uh, ben is with the Economic Studies Program and the Hutchins Center. Mark is with our Metropolitan Studies Program. And we're here to talk today about defense uh, and the defense sector more generally and its effects on the U.S. economy and vice versa. So there's a lot on the table. And uh, we're going to talk about everything from defense's role in short-term economic policy or effects on short-term growth to longer-term issues about defense's role in potentially aiding uh, the development of research and development technologies, the ways in which defense can help the economy and vice versa, but of course also the way in which defense spending is a significant part of our budget and our budget deficit. So it, it runs both ways and we're trying to discuss all these different implications. My job this morning uh, as moderator is first to frame a couple of the broad considerations here before introducing uh, Ben and Mark and then asking each of them a few questions. We'll spend about half the time doing that and then go to you for your questions. I think you all know uh, beyond the broad interest in this question the importance of the subject right now. Congress is soon to return home uh, to Washington and to face the question of how to avert a potential sequester or even a shutdown. And defense and debates over defense spending are a part of that conversation to be sure. We're all watching presidential candidates, and for those of you uh, who are watching a lot of C-SPAN these days, this is not the Iowa State Fair. And, 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 and none, of, none of us at president are running for president, although perhaps one of us should be. Uh, but, but we are going to still talk about defense's role in broader economic strategy and broader uh, national competitiveness in an era when we all know these issues have been first and front and foremost in voters' minds as they should be. Uh, let me, before I introduce Ben and Mark, uh, and then go to some questions for each of them, let me just say a couple more words to put defense spending in perspective. And I'm going to try not to overdo the statistics speaking here uh, out loud without a lot of visual props and therefore not wanting to drown you in numbers. But I think uh, a couple of them would be useful. And as you probably know, some of you, Defense is now representing, the defense sector is representing a little less than 3.5% of our gross domestic product. So just under 3.5%. That's a downward slope from about 4.5% at the very end of the Bush years, early Obama years, when the wars were at their peak. And we're headed downward now towards perhaps 3% of gross domestic product at the very end of the Obama presidency. And projections would have it decline further thereafter, although who knows what the world will bring, what the next uh, president and Congress will bring. By historical standards, this is a modest burden on the US economy, certainly compared to anything in the World War II or post-World War II era. Uh, in the Clinton years, we were also around 3%. But in the Reagan years, we had been up closer to 6% of GDP, defense as a fraction of overall national economic activity. And in much of the 1950s and 60s, the figure was often 8% to 10%. So that's just one way to put it in perspective. But also, of course, defense spending is still very big. It's still almost $600 billion a year, it's still about 15% of the federal budget. That's much reduced from earlier periods, but it's still a large fraction of the overall budget, to be clear and to be sure. Uh, and, and therefore, this is certainly one of the main ways in which the federal government interacts with the broader economy. So if we just frame things in those terms, I think you begin to get a sense of, of the importance of the sector. A few more statistics, and then for the real show here. Um, even though defense is only a little more than 3% of national GDP, it can be a lot more in certain parts of the country. And that's certainly one of the things that I know Mark is going to talk about, and I'll say why uh, his interests have taken him in those directions in just a moment. But we're just across the river from Virginia. Virginia has the highest defense concentration or dependency of any state. 13% of Virginia's gross state output is defense spending of one sort or another. By the way, when I say defense in this context, I'm including the intelligence community, and I'm including also the nuclear weapons activities of the Department of Energy. I'm not including veterans affairs, not including homeland security, just to be very clear on definitions. Although you can certainly bring those subjects into discussion if you wish a little bit later on. Here in DC and uh, in Maryland, defense is more like 6% of state or local economic output. So it's substantial. 
Another way to look at it is in terms of defense's role in high technology, in promoting manufacturing, research, and development. And again, here the defense sector is a bigger share of the national economy than that 3% of GDP number would, uh, would imply. So for example, in national manufacturing, military procurement's about 100 billion a year. National uh, manufacturing output's around 2 trillion, so it's 5% of national manufacturing output, and a lot more in certain sectors like aerospace, space launch, some others that we'll talk about today. One last way of looking at it, research and development. Research and development spending, by some metrics, defense and related activities are 20% of all national research and development. Now that probably overstates things, and I'm not gonna bore you with all the details right now, but it's probably fair to say that as a fraction of overall national research and development, the defense, defense sector attributes or can be attributed to maybe 10% of total activity in this domain. And that's largely government money. It's also to some extent the money of defense contractors as they're looking to promote new ideas for the future. Uh, so as you can see, there's a lot going on. Uh, the technologies that are at issue include not only aerospace, as I mentioned earlier, cyber, propulsion, advanced materials, nanotechnology, a number of other things that are going to be central in our future national competitiveness more broadly defined. So that's why today's subjects are important. And again, we're very grateful that you would come out on a hot August morning uh, to join us here. Um, Mark Muro has been at Brookings now for about eight years. Like Ben, he's a Harvard grad. He then went to Berkeley uh, for his graduate work and then spent a lot of time in Arizona, certainly one of the up and coming states by many measures of uh, advanced industry, and that's going to be one of the things we talk about today. He worked as a journalist and also as a scholar in Arizona before joining the Metropolitan Studies Program. Uh, one of my favorite studies that he's worked on at Brookings is called Launch! Exclamation mark, And it's about Colorado and its role in the space launch industry and ways in which national government, local government, public sector, private sector, universities can work together to further the competitive advantage that Colorado already had. And that's just a case study of the broader dynamics that we'll be talking about uh, today. He's also done a good deal of writing on advanced industries more generally in the United States and on green technology and a few other things. Uh, ben Bernanke needs no introduction. Uh, we're very, very uh, grateful to have him at Brookings where he is, as I say, a scholar in economic studies and at the Hutchins Center. As you know, he was chairman of the Federal Reserve from 2006 through 2014. Uh, he and I were both born in Augusta, Georgia. I won't claim that I knew him then, uh, but, but I have known him since the 1980s when he was a professor at Princeton when I was a graduate student. Let me just say he was one of the most supportive, collegial, and encouraging professors back then, and his personality has not changed in the slightest despite uh, the, uh, the, the fame that he's accumulated since that time. He uh, was on the Council of Economic Advisors prior to being chairman of the Fed and had had other roles in the Fed as well. He was at Princeton. Uh, through the 1990s, essentially, as chairman of the economic studies or economic department, and, and also with the Woodrow Wilson School. So he was at Princeton from the mid 80s through the early 2000s. Uh, his PhD was at MIT. And uh, for those of you who also haven't yet discovered it, you should definitely check out Ben Bernanke's blog. It is one of the most um, entertaining and sometimes even tricks you into learning some macroeconomics along the way. So I was reading the other day his views on whether uh, Alexander Hamilton should be taken off the $10 bill. And, uh, and I learned a lot of fiscal policy and monetary policy in the process. By the way, the answer is no, uh, but I'm sure you can say more <laughs> later on if you wish. Uh, but he also blogged about the Washington Nationals back in July. And uh, maybe he'll have more to say on that subject as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, but maybe not. Um, so uh, before we launch into questions, let me, since we, we have the opportunity here to, uh, to, to thank Ben for his service to the country, let me please ask you to join me in doing that right now. And I'm going to begin with him. Let me say, this is not a sneak preview of his book, The Courage to Act, which will be, I think, his fourth or fifth book. He wrote economics textbooks at Princeton. He also wrote essays on the Great Depression uh, when he was a professor in an earlier period and, and working with the Fed. Uh, and so this book will come out on October 4th, and it will be, I'm sure, much acclaimed and much watched, but there will be different events about that. But today is not one of them. Uh, today, um, Ben, I'd like to begin by, first of all, thanking you again again for joining us uh, with this discussion and asking you initially just how do you think about the size of the defense budget and the appropriateness from an economics perspective? 
Well, thanks, Mike, and thanks for inviting me uh, to speak on this top, important topic today. Um, we haven't known each other for a long time, not in Augusta. I was a lot older than you, um, but at Princeton, and I've uh, followed Mike's work uh, ever since then. I always found him to be one of the most thoughtful and balanced writers about uh, national defense. Um, also, full disclosure, obviously I'm not a defense expert. Um, I am an economist, though, and I hope to be able to bring that perspective to help us understand the role of the military and defense uh, in the U.S. economy. Uh, you ask about the size of the military, and, and you, you cited before a whole bunch of numbers, the total spending. Um, obviously, the, the, those numbers are important for thinking about the amount of resources that are being used uh, in, in the national defense. But I guess I want to start by being anti-economic and saying that those dollar figures are not necessarily a very good measure of capabilities and, and, and uh, potentialities. Um, one number, just to take the opportunity, one number that bothers me a lot is the is the journalistic tendency to say, well, the United States spends more than the rest of our you know, potential competitors combined, therefore we are militarily secure. And I, I think that's obviously uh, a mistake from a lot of ways. We have different goals, different uh, needs. But in particular, uh, there's the problem of making comparisons across countries using exchange rates to try to evaluate qualitative differences. So uh, if I'm comparing um, the uh, living standards of the United States and China, uh, I don't want to look simply at uh, exchange rate adjusted GDP per person. Instead, I want to do what economists call a purchasing power parity comparison, which means that I want to take into account that uh, labor is much cheaper in China, therefore haircuts, for example, which may be, of, who knows, of equal quality to those you get in Washington uh, in China, are much cheaper and contribute much less to the GDP, but nevertheless, any attempt to compare uh, uh, the standard of living of the United States and China needs to take into account those differences in, in costs. And the same thing applies to, um, to the military, and, and the comparison of labor costs between the U.S. and China is a, a good case in point. Uh, we did a little bit of work before the session to try to figure out the relevant numbers, and we, what best we could find, uh, Peter Olson, my research assistant, and I worked on this a little bit, best we could find is that the uh, U.S. military calculates that uh, we spend about $110,000 for each active military member. Uh, we're talking now about pay and benefits. We're not talking about training. We're not talking about equipment. We're just talking about sort of the personnel costs. Uh, we spend about 90000 per person for each civilian member uh, of, the, uh, of the defense effort. Uh, in comparison, the um, per worker, um, uh, an urban worker in China earns about $9,000 a year. And so I don't know exactly what the Chinese uh, personnel costs are, but they're obviously a lot less than 110000 So uh, this is an example of how just looking at you know dollar figures or renminbi figures can be deceptive. Um, and uh, you know, this is something, by the way, this is something that the defense uh, industry, that defense specialists, I think, understand. The Pentagon and the State Department do calculate PPP comparisons. And you find in that case, for example, that uh, under PPP comparisons, instead of being 45% of world military spending, U.S. military spending is more like a third uh, of global spending. So these comparisons are important. Ultimately, uh, you know, I think we can underst we should understand, and I'm the right person to say this, that economics can only take us so far. In, in the end, in thinking about the size of the military and, and our uh, resource expenditures, we need to think about our foreign policy goals, the threats we might face, the capacities we need to develop, and ultimately, of course, the long-run budget constraints that we that we ultimately do face. But um, you know, I'm, this is just a small pitch for thinking about things in purchasing power parity terms and in in more uh, uh, utilitarian terms rather than in simply in, in dollar in dollar functions. So that's I think an important initial point to make. Thank you, and we'll come back to the defense budget relative to the broader government budget and its fiscal drain a little bit later. But let me ask you first about something that you had to deal with in the last five, six years, which is defense spending coming down at a time when you were trying to, along with other policymakers, figure out a way to get the United States out of recession. How are those two dynamics linked? Did defense cuts complicate your task? Uh, how much did they affect the way you looked at the problem? Well, uh, so defense spending, military spending, is connected to growth through a number of different, me different mechanisms. And you're thinking specifically of what you would call the Keynesian demand side mechanism. How much does spending on um, 
military uh, functions, how much does it affect the total demand in the economy, and, and, and in particularly in a situation where uh, you have unemployment, high unemployment or recession, you know, we standard textbook uh, macroeconomics says that increased spending will increase activity by, you know, by adding to the demand for, for goods and services. Um, generally speaking, I think it's, it's best uh, to keep you know, the, the military uh, preparedness goals are separate from these short run cyclical considerations. Not to say they're not sometimes important. The, the, the most obvious example was, uh, of course, World War II, where this enormous national effort uh, in World War II brought the U.S. economy out of the Great Depression um, and had enormous impact on, on total output and it lasted even beyond, um, beyond the war. Uh, a more negative example would be the 1960s when the uh, Vietnam effort uh, contributed to the overheating of the U.S. economy and led to the inflation in part that we saw in the 1970s. So it can be important, but there's no sense necessarily in which that the changes in defense spending will be, you know, the move in the direction that you would want from a purely cyclical point of view. Recently, um, you know, military spending is now a much smaller share of, of GDP than it was obviously in the 40s or certainly in the 60s. Uh, and so the effects are much smaller, but they have been, they were mildly negative, I think, in the, in the last few years. Um, starting around 2010, um, the uh, decline, the drawdowns in military spending were a negative uh, in U.S. GDP growth. Uh, up to a point of three or four tenths uh, on growth uh, in GDP, not enormous, but but noticeable, uh, and that was in turn um, partly due to the uh, drawdown of the wars in in Afghanistan and Iraq, but also in part due to um, uh, the the deliberate budget cutting that took place uh, in. 2010, and in fact, the worst year in terms of adverse effects was 2013, which was a very negative uh, uh, year in terms of fiscal contraction and the effects on our economy. So I guess I would summarize by saying that, um, first, that uh, the, the effects on demand side growth uh, last few years have been mildly negative. Uh, part of it was completely understandable, certainly you wouldn't want to uh, to determine the resources devoted to the Iraq and Afghanistan in any way by U.S. Uh, cyclical conditions. But the other part, I think, was uh, to some extent a self-inflicted wound, since all these cuts were made for presumably economic reasons, but in fact they mo went mostly in the wrong direction in the sense that they were uh, a mild negative in an economy that was trying to recover. Uh, we'll come back to it, I'm sure, but um, uh, you know, there are many other connections between military spending uh, and the defense establishment and economic growth, but on the particular, this particularly narrow case of the effects on total demand, uh, it's less of a deal than it used to be because defense spending is, is a smaller part of the economy, but I think unwisely that the cuts in military spending, which were not motivated by defense needs uh, last few years uh, were actually uh, a negative in terms of our economic recovery. So as you mentioned about specific sectors and getting into that in a little bit more detail and looking at national research and development, I wondered if, if you had specific thoughts on which technology sectors were most important where defense does contribute or just generally how to think about this problem. We were talking earlier and many people here remember of course that um, in previous eras, defense had a huge role in creating advanced technologies or promoting them. Everything from nuclear technology in the 1940s, helicopters, advanced jet engines, uh, a number of other uh, technologies, the invention of the internet, many other things. Uh, defense was crucial and then of course NASA contributed as well. Uh, if we think more generally about the federal role. Uh, today it's a much smaller fraction of overall research and development spending just as defense is a smaller fraction of GDP. Do you still think there are areas is where it's particularly important. So broadly, we were talking about the growth connection through demand. I think the most, the most important in medium and long term, by far the most important effects of military spending are on the supply side of the economy. And uh, that works through a number of different mechanisms, including training and other things. But by far the most important, uh, certainly in the United States, has been the linkages between defense, military appropriations, and broader technological trends. That's where it's one of the major sources of U.S. growth over time. We were 
main um, uh, technological leader. It's one of our national strengths. And so it's very first order importance to try to understand the relationship between what the military is doing and what's uh, happening uh, in terms of productivity and technology. So let's just specify that that is a critical uh, issue and we need to understand that. Now, from an economist's point of view, there's actually a sort of a standard argument which says that um, the government ought to be conducting basic research. And that goes back to Ken Arrow, Nobel Prize winner, Larry Summers' uncle, so that's another qualification he has. Um, the, the argument basically is that uh, base, most basic research, scientific research, the, it may have tremendous economic returns, but they're very hard for the, uh, the scientist or the engineer to capture because this is just basic, broad-based research. And so there's a case for the government to subsidize that kind of basic research through grants or through direct activities and so on. So that's, that's kind of the intellectual case for, um, uh, for government research. The fact is, though, if you look at uh, the composition of uh, federally sponsored research, most of it is not basic, basic, you know, fundamental science. Most of it is what you might call mission-related research. That is, rather than um, uh, studying the basic properties of, of atoms, you know, the most of the federally funded research would be about how to, you know, incorporate our understanding of you know, nuclear forces into a, miss, a missile system or whatever it might be. So that's a, that's a more subtle question. So given that we have much more focus on, on mission-related research as opposed to basic research, you know, what's the connection between what the government does and what the private sector does? As you pointed out, the federal um, R&D is, is, is big. It's about 40% of total uh, uh, U.S. R&D, about half of that being military. It's been coming down over time, but it's still a very big component. Um, now, as you look at this area, uh, a lot of what you get is the anecdotes, and there are a lot of great stories going back to the Manhattan Project and, and so on, and there are many examples of, of um, uh, military R&D or defense-related R&D, which has been very productive on the private sector side. An example that I like is, um, is laser uh, technology, which uh, was begun uh, as a military application, but there have since been something like 55,000 patents related to laser technologies, and you, the things that come out of that include laser surgery and barcodes and DVD players and a whole range of things that have come out of that. Everyone is aware of uh, the nuclear components, aware of the um, uh, the internet that came out of DARPA and so on. So, so obviously there are plenty of examples of um, where uh, military technology has been extremely important uh, for uh, private sector uh, growth and technology. Now that being said, you know economists have tried to identify the channels, and there there's some that work in both directions. On the one hand. Um, the, uh, the spending by the government can can create capacity in the economy. You know, create more training for scientists and engineers who can work in both military and non-military areas. Can pay the fixed costs of underlying uh, research. Um, and there's a lot of complementarities between the things that happen in the military sector and also happen in the private sector. On, on the other hand, you can think of ways in which um, military research is uh, uh, counterproductive. Uh, for example, a lot of it is um, uh, secretive uh, for, for classified you know, reasons uh, that uh, it can't be shared easily with the private sector. Uh, in some cases, it uses up scarce resources, specific scientific uh, resources, and obviously if they're used up by the military, they're not available for uh, the private sector. Um, so it goes in both ways, uh, but the studies, I, get, I think the f a fair summary would be that the, the studies that have looked at the <coughs> empirical relationship between R&D spending at the military, on the military, and R&D spending outside show a positive relationship. The complements are probably somewhat stronger than the substitute effects. So uh, every dollar of extra military R&D not only does not displace a dollar of private sector R&D, it probably adds 20 or 30 cents of extra private sector R&D because of the things that are learned in the military application. So I, I think that if you want to make a case that uh, U.S. military preparedness and uh, spending have made a positive impact on U.S. growth, it would probably be through the R&D uh, linkages and spillovers, which, which seem to be positive and seem to have been beneficial. So I, I think that's an important finding and, and one that 
probably argues in a sense, particularly for more basic research, which again the economic case uh, is very strong. But finally, just to wrap up on this, I think though that um, whenever you talk about the effect of some government spending program, you always have to ask yourself, what's the counterfactual? So th instead of spending money on specifically on military purposes, if the same money were spent on basic science, that would probably be a better strategy. But but all else equal, you know, the evidence does seem to be that uh, military R&D spending uh, has had positive spillovers on, on private sector <coughs> spending. So a related subject, manufacturing and uh, obviously closely linked in with research and development, but I wanted to ask your thoughts on the defense sector's role in national manufacturing. As we all know, and please correct me if I'm you know, summarizing incorrectly, but U.S. manufacturing output has been on a small upswing lately, partly due to the shale energy revolution and improved competitiveness, but over time, certainly the number of manufacturing jobs has gone way down, largely because of robotics and automation, but we've been concerned you know, throughout our adult lives about declining American competitiveness in some industries, and Mark writes on that too. Um, so to what extent does defense play into this? Does it, does it help counter that trend? Does it, uh, is it only going to be helpful in certain specific areas like aerospace? How do you think about defense's role in shoring up the American manufacturing base? Well, it's important to understand um, you know, why manufacturing jobs are going down, and you touched on it with the robotics comment that you made. Um, the amount of the share of U.S. output that is manufacturing is actually not changed all that much over time. Uh, we remain a very big manufacturing uh, economy and exporter, um, but the number of manufacturing jobs has gone down a lot because manufacturing productivity has has you know grown so quickly that it essentially it takes far fewer workers to build an automobile today than it did you know 20 years ago or 40 years ago, and as a result, uh, you know, for, with a lot of implications, the the number of you know particularly lower skilled manufacturing jobs has, has been greatly reduced. Um, if you think about the relationship of that to defense, other than of course the fact that defense is in, indeed a, a major industry and one that in some sense has to be on shore, or at least most of it has to be on shore, I think that it's important to understand again that, that what's happening to U.S. manufacturing is not in some sense that it's being uh, gutted out. What's happening instead is that we are increasing productivity, which is the lowest number of jobs that are created, and also moving up the value added chain. So we don't make a lot of, you know, simple manufactured goods anymore. We make um, uh, we make more sophisticated machine tools and 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 specialized equipment and so on. That has a couple of consequences. One is that we're not heading back towards a manufacturing sector which is going to provide jobs for low, low skilled people. It's much more so than in the past, uh, an industry that is going to provide jobs for higher skilled workers um, and higher paid workers. Um, what that means is that the relationship between uh, defense and U.S. manufacturing is probably a, a, a mostly a complementary one, but for the same reasons I was talking about in terms of R&D, that to the extent that um, uh, defense manufacturing leads to uh, more sophisticated products and technological advance, it's going to probably support U.S. manufacturing more broadly to some extent, but not it's not going to take us back to the world of the 1950s when you had, you know, right. assembly lines with hundreds of workers, uh, you know, building a car. So uh, it is probably a mild positive. Again, it's always a question of what the counterfactual is. You know, where is the money going else? Uh, otherwise, but it's, it's not taking us back to the to the uh, pre, you know, pre pre-technological revolution days of much more labor-intensive manufacturing. And that leads naturally into the broader question about defense's role in the labor market, and we were talking about that earlier as well. You just touched on the half concerning manufacturing and production of equipment. There's obviously also the direct employees of the Department of Defense, and as again, most people in this room will know, but a quick reminder, they're in three broad categories. There are about 1.4 million active duty full-time uniform personnel, a little bit less than that right now. About, I guess about 1.4 million. There are almost uh, 800,000 full-time civilians employed by the Department of Defense, full-time government workers, but not in uniform. And then there's about 900 and some thousand uh, in the broader reserve component of the U.S. military, part-time soldiers, sailors, airmen, airwomen, and Marines. Uh, so those three categories together, uh, 
represent a couple percent of the U.S. workforce. And uh, then, of course, there's the manufacturing side of things. How do you think about defense's role in the labor market? Well, um, you know, we're used to thinking of job creation as, as a good thing, which of course it is, but um, you, you know, you, you want to avoid sort of the mindset of the congressman who wants to have a base in his district, right? Because uh, the creation of jobs through expenditure by the government, uh, it's creating jobs, yes, but the output of those workers is, is in some sense is not contributing to the standards of living, it's contributing to a, a different set of uh, outcomes. So. Um, uh, clearly, the fact that we have whatever 1.4 million active duty uh, soldiers is, in some sense, a cost to our economy. I mean, it's, their services are being obviously they're important. I'm not in any way saying there's too many or too few, but uh, their services are you know being used for for defense purposes and are not obviously contributing to the private economy. And so we, we shouldn't be confused into saying, oh, the more people we employ in the military, the better. Obviously, on the one hand, you're creating jobs, but on the other hand, the output of that, those jobs are not contributing to private sector standards of living. So it is a real cost that we have to bear the, the f fiscal and economic burden of a large military. Maybe good reasons for it, but it, it's, a, it's a cost, not a benefit. Uh, but a related question that one is, I think is really important uh, it goes back to this issue about the linkages between defense spending and R&D is you know the when you see the army ads on television it's kind of like you know come in the army we'll train you to be a computer scientist or something and you go out and you know, and so there's an important question one that economists have looked at in great detail is to what extent does uh, does army or military experience add to the training and skills of those workers so that when they go back to the private sector do they bring with them you know skills and, and earning potential that they otherwise would not have had and if to the case to the extent that that's the case for individuals that's a bit of an offset for the fact that they, you know, their services were not available to the private sector while they were in the military. Now, there have been a lot of really interesting studies of this, and of course, as in economics, nothing is ever finally settled. But um, the evidence appears to be, though, that that um, there really is not a, an advantage. I mean, if you are, if, if you go into the military at age 18, versus an identical person who stays in the private sector and you know takes a private sector job. Uh, ten years later, if you leave the military, your your skills and wages are probably not going to be quite as high on average as the private sector person. Um, the, one of the great studies of this, uh, one of our colleagues at Princeton, Josh Angris, who I taught in macro, graduate macro, he didn't do this paper in that paper, of course, but his uh, he did a great paper where he looked at. Uh, people based on their draft lottery number. Mine was 335, by the way, thank God. Um, so if you had a very uh, low draft number, you had a high chance of being drafted. If you had a very high number, you were not going to be drafted. And so by using that as kind of an instrument, he was able to figure out you know, how otherwise similar people fared in terms of their long-term labor market experience. And what he found was, again, as I said before, is that people who you know, went into the army and then came back out. Um, that they were a little bit. That their skills and pay were actually a little bit below their counterparts for a while, but over time there was some tendency to move back towards average. But there was not really a benefit. Now people have broken this down. I mean, it could very well be that the Vietnam era, you know, was a different thing from the all civilian or or the all volunteer uh, military, uh, and there probably is some difference between having you know being trained in 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 combat versus being trained in electronics. And there is some difference there, but unfortunately. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much evidence that uh, the training implications are, are, are all that positive from 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 uh, the military. So, uh, you know, overall, the labor market, uh, the people who go in the military have similar or maybe slightly worse outcomes. For example, uh, if you are a um, a veteran who left after 2001, your current unemployment rate is about 7.1, 7.2%, 7 as opposed to a national 5.3%. If you are a veteran of any age, though, your, your unemployment rate is a little bit lower than that. But uh, So I think the best way to think about it is that the military takes you know, our young people and, and uses them for good purposes, but um, it's not really adding much to the private sector you know, through training or other 
uh, or other experience. Last comment is uh, there's a whole interesting area which has not seen as much research, which I think is worth looking at, which is the relative experience of reservists versus you know, longer term, uh, you know, permanent uh, stationed people. Um, reservists, on the one hand, they don't leave the private sector, so they're able to continue to accumulate uh, work experience. On the other hand, you know, their work experience is disrupted, you know, by being called to duty. Um, so I think it's a really important question that probably hasn't gotten enough attention is, you know, how, what's the right combination from an economic point of view? What's the right combination of, of active duty versus reservist, um, you know, uh, military? and I, I think that's a question we don't really know the answer to yet. One last question for you, Ben, in this round. Uh, we were, I, I may ask you later, or let others in the crowd get at the issue of um, comparing the role of the Fed Reserve Chairman to military uh, Joint Chiefs Chairman or SecDef for some of the, the political sensitivities and delicacy. We'll, we'll save that for later. But I, before going to Mark, I do want to ask you one more uh, question to wrap the economics discussion together, which is when you think about the nation's deficit, which of course has come down, but perhaps only temporarily, and obviously our debt's fairly big uh, compared to GDP, and defense's role within that. Uh, what are your broad observations? So I'm first on the size of the deficit and trajectory of the deficit, but then also defense's contribution to the deficit. So it's important to start with a couple of just general observations. One is that the deficit obviously soared, you know, during during the recession, of course, because tax revenues went down by so much. So the ratio of national debt held by the public to our GDP went from about 35% before the crisis and the recession to about 75% today. So there's been a big increase in the amount of debt outstanding. And that has long run implications for our ability to service uh, any kind of, you know, government provided um, expenditures, including, of course, military. Now, but the other thing, the other thing to understand, a couple other facts to understand. One is that while there's a lot of talk about the long run problems of the deficit, th they're really long run. They're not that short run. So like I said the, the, the debt to GDP ratio in the U.S. today is about 75 percent. The Congressional Budget Office projects that in 10 years it'll be about 77 percent. So it's going to be pretty flat. Next few years, deficits are down now to about 2.5 percent of GDP, which is pretty low. So we're not looking at a big in increase in the deficit over the next 10 years or so. Beyond that time, then the Congressional Budget Office has deficits and debt increasing more significantly. And the answer to that question, why that's the case, I think one of the great aphorisms about the federal government is the federal government is basically an insurance company with an army. Uh, and it's the insurance part that is the costly part for us because uh, the, the projections of big increases in deficits 10, 20 years down the road are mostly tied to the uh, health care costs, Medicare, Medicaid, and are based on the uh, projection that health care costs will continue to rise at the rapid rate we've seen over the last 20, 30 years. That turns out to be the key issue in terms of long-run deficit planning. Um, if health care costs do not grow so quickly, and recently there's been a little bit of good news on that front, uh, then deficits will not be a problem you know, within our lifetime anyway, Mike. So, um, but, um, you know, if, if that health care issues continue to be severe, then that, that's going to be uh, a constraint on long-term uh, ability of the government to provide various services. Um, but I think th the bottom line to draw from this is that uh, it was, I think it was, it was wrong, it was a mistake that, you know, during, with the sequestration, those things, that there were these inefficiencies, there was these, there was these steps taken uh, to, to correct the deficit in the very short run that probably had long run costs in terms of preparedness, in terms of canceling systems that were midway and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I would just conclude by saying that there's nothing in our deficit prospect that should make us uh, distort our defense planning in the near term. And we should be making our decisions based on medium term considerations, based on what makes the most sense in terms of efficiency for achieving our objectives. There's no reason to be taking draconian steps right now to, uh, that will have long run costly implications for our defense posture just for deficit reasons. The deficit is a longer run issue and we should be thinking about it in a longer run context. Very helpful. Mark, I want to now ask you a couple of questions. Uh, you've listened to Ben, and uh, so there's a lot on the table. And I just wanted to ask you to, to reflect and react, but also specifically to, again, bring back your interest and focus on um, advanced industry 
and on some key geographic sectors in the United States where some of the kind of partnerships you've written about may involve defense as a player. Just how would you interpret some of these same questions, especially on the issues of research and development, advanced industry, and manufacturing? Absolutely. And uh, thanks, Mike, for having me. Great to be here with you, Ben, and, uh, and the whole uh, uh, foreign policy and economic studies teams. So, so right off, I'll just uh, really appreciate the focus on what defense actually is here rather than uh, some of the bumper stickers. Uh, and I'll just add, uh, uh, to begin with, no doubt it's an important component everywhere uh, for the most part, but I do want to make the point that though there are 4,000 bases out there in you know hundreds and hundreds of communities across the country, uh, Defense itself varies widely in, from place to place. You know, we're the Metropolitan, I work I'm with the Metropolitan Policy Program. We're very interested in subnational variation. And, uh, you know, you touched on it, but if you look at the projected defense purchases detail by industry and state uh, DOD publication, you do get to quite wide variation of the local importance of, of this economy. Uh, you know, I think you, you touched on this a little bit. We don't think where defense doesn't matter very much too often. But in fact, New York, Oregon, Minnesota, Michigan, and West Virginia, it's less than 1% of uh, state GDP, you know? So, and then but as you alluded to, Virginia, Hawaii, Maine, Mississippi, DC, Alabama, uh, Kentucky, uh, Alaska, six, six to 6.5 percent. So a significant local importance. So we're having a conversation, really, we're, which need to have multiple conversations when we talk about economic impact. And it's not a, a, a uniform, you know, it's not flat across space. It's spiky. It's hugely important in a short list of places, massively crucial anchor in certain places like you know, Virginia, for instance, or Kentucky, Colorado. So many places absolutely right to be thinking about, you know, very concerned about the local economic impacts, but many places not so much. But so but I'm, I'm uh, less worried about these aspects of the economy, uh, the defense economy, then the extent to which U.S. military expenditures in the absence of systematic thinking about our economic base uh, remain the nation's main driver or, or a signif significant val uh, driver has been suggested of high value industrial uh, activity, uh, especially technology innovation. I think while these uh, effects may be declining over time, we're talking about you know, a 70, 80, 90 year uh, history of, inv uh, of investment uh, and experimentation that has left us with a, a critical sense, uh, a set of industries so that we need to think about. And what I'm gonna argue here is that we need, uh, as we think about the size of the military uh, uh, Poster considered the rest of our economic strategy to ensure that we uh, protect and build these industries. So, um, you know, my group here at Brookings has identified what we call the nation's advanced industries: 50 uh, high R&D, high STEM, in, uh, in STEM intensive industries that inordinately anchor the economy. That's not just a claim. You know, these uh, uh, inordinately uh, uh, drive patenting inordinately drive innovation, productivity growth, exports, and so on. So they really are, uh, you know, about only about 10% of the economy in terms of employment, but a significant driver of uh, our, our global uh, prosperity. Um, you know, so ranging from aerospace, semiconductors, medical device uh, manufacturer, but also, uh, so those manufacturing side, but uh, a number of energy F, uh, initiatives, renewables, fracking uh, is critical here, and then high-tech services like computer services design, uh, computer systems design. So the point here, though, is, you know, these have, they, these reflect decades of productive interaction between the military and the private sector, including those secret pieces, including in, in, inadvertent spillovers of uh, knowledge. They reflect decades of strategic capacity building, maybe inefficient, maybe not. 
uh, and then decades of directed DOD procurement. So I, I'm here I'm looking at a different uh, channel of reaction. So, and I'll go further. In the absence of you know a consistent, urgent non-military industry uh, uh, strategy, such as many of our competitors, whether it's Germany, South Korea, or China, have had, defense expenditures have functioned as something of a stealth. Uh, industrial policy. Uh, for better or worse, uh, I'm arguing uh, on balance uh, they have been helpful. Uh, the defense budget has turned out to be the only place that one could argue for and deliver certain kinds of useful uh, economic industry innovation uh, because somewhat beyond criticism uh, for a long time. So in that sense, since World War II, uh, this has arguably been the nation's steadiest and most creative uh, supporter of technology progress. Uh, uh, you know, I, I won't bore you with a lot of the anecdotes that I think Ben alluded to, but you know, World War II, key source of funding for foundational scientific research. Manhattan Project created the National Lab System, arguably one of our most important these distributed networks of uh, uh, in a, uh, and a core piece of the innovation system. DARPA, with its experiments in new formats of uh, uh, blue sky inventive thinking, establishing in many respects the startup as an idea, promoting decentralized network in innovation, uh, you know, sophisticated kind of uh, initiative uh, that, that is, I think, not just in its spending or its science led to you know, uh, uh, structural approaches, uh, structural innovations. And clearly, recent just invest, uh, uh, heavy uh, in investments in emerging fields, whether it's computer science, material science, solid state, uh, 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 atomic uh, 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 movements, data analytics, robotics, the list goes on. So, uh, and then, it's a deployed huge procurement budget. So this is a different, in this sense, uh, not just early stage R&D, but creating markets for new technologies. Uh, um, in this regard, my friend uh, Dan Sararitz, uh, Arizona State University, stresses the special attributes of, of military innovation. Uh, uh, you know, this is a, a focused mission, enduring ties to the private sector have been a distinctive feature of, of uh, 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 the military uh, enterprise. And then this role as an early customer uh, for advanced technologies. <coughs> um, whether it be nanophotonic microprocessors or artificial intelligence software, data analytics, uh, to some extent, the military continues to not just uh, make the early investments, but to be a discerning, strategic, early customer. So that's what I worry about. The, that's the and the question isn't simply to maintain the the military effort at its size for perhaps inefficient to maintain in, perhaps inefficient uh, innovation and industry benefits, but it's. Uh, you know, it's about uh, making sure that we look at the overall economy and consider other, maybe civilian interventions that would parallel. That. So, you yeah. make a really good point, which is, you know, in an ideal world, we would have uh, government-sponsored basic research, and many of these things you talk about would be coming out of long-run considerations for technical change and, and need to maintain technological leadership. Our political system is not good at investing in long-run, right. uh, making long-run investments with, with uncertain payoffs. And the, the, the political impact of military R&D is that people can concretely see you know, the effects uh, that military spending has yeah. a privileged place in the political system. It's unfortunate in a way, that's, if that's the main reason that we're getting this, that again, ideally we would have a much broader based program that would look at both non-military and military uh, uses, but this appears to be one of the main functions of military spending is to create a political basis and support for. I mean, conceivably, I mean, I think to date, necessary interventions have migrated to the defense budget uh, for, uh, for delivery. 
I think the the request here or the, the the call here I think very much in your spirit is to have a broader discussion in which uh, the defense budget is simply a component of a coherent national stance, which may be laissez-faire in the end, but um, I don't think it would be. Uh, so just so, one more question yeah. for me too, and then we can uh, involve uh, all of you in the discussion as well. Uh, as I hear you, Mark, and building on what Ben just asked, it sounds like you're impressed by the ways in which the defense sector has contributed to national economic growth, but also aware of t at least two limitations. One, defense is coming down as a percent of national resources, and therefore it's not going to be as adequate as it might have been. And secondly, we just need a better civilian strategy to complement, as Ben was saying, uh, because I've read your reports on advanced industry, and you're not that happy about where we stand internationally and competitively right now. So am I correct in hearing that what you'd like to see is sustained solid support in some sense for defense, not not throw away the baby with the bathwater, keep that part, but complement it with a stronger civilian strategy. I think from a defense economy uh, point of view, I'm, I'm somewhat agnostic. The question is, uh, are we going to maintain an economic posture or an economic stance that clearly centrally will have, have a public-private collaborative element um, and this is not an argument for heavy-handed industrial policy, but it, it is about uh, you know a degree of public investment, public uh, creativity, and experimentation in partnership with the private sector. Let me ask uh, just yeah. um, one follow-up to yeah. maybe give a couple of the highlights of what you wrote about in regard to Colorado as a case study, and then uh, m maybe Ben has a follow-up, and if not, we'll, we'll go to all of you. But I would just think that to make this concrete, you could maybe tell a little bit about what's in that excellent report from, I guess, now two years ago? Yeah. Please. Um, well, we, we came on the scene there at a time of you know, consternation, uh, uh, late 2011, concern about looming discussion of sequestration, uh, and uh, found uh, regional economic development officials, various military leaders, and uh, 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 progressive uh, uh, Democratic governor, uh, uh, John Hickenlooper, very concerned about uh, threats to a front range uh, complex of uh, bases that harbored significant uh, high end uh, data, missile preparedness, communications uh, uh, capabilities that had yield or created along the front range, uh, you know, a extremely, uh, uh, you know, real exemplar of the kind of side effect economies that can grow up in regional ecosystems around these kinds of complexes that in this case, uh, you know, were built up not for economic reasons, but had yielded, uh, you know, a major aerospace, space defense uh, complex that had begun to move towards new commercial applications and in, in, in some cases had begun to uh, evolve away from uh, government, government contracting already. So we arrived, looked at this, surveyed especially the space, aerospace piece, um, and you know, recommended you know, acceleration wherever possible of the move off the dole and into the commercial space uh, uh, location where they have you know, companies that are delivering earth observation technologies that uh, you all have are, are, are using on your cell phones when you use uh, uh, Google Maps, for instance, uh, uh, major companies, uh, where services being hung off of uh, uh, tech, uh, of technology and, and launch uh, capability were allowing uh, significant com commercial growth. So a strategy emerged there. Uh, this is a state that, uh, you know, it, it wants to make sure that it continues that evolution, uh, wants to protect the base, but also move into commercial applications, a kind of diversification strategy. And I would just hold this up as an example, I think, of another factor, which is going to be the kind of uh, responses of subnational actors around this huge federal uh, activity. Uh, this is a state that created an industry champion to both 
watch the, the military budget, but also uh, uh, work to build networking among uh, various uh, space-related industries. Wound up creating a, a $200 million accelerator uh, program for supporting uh, small, you know, small uh, startups in the space. So I think this is another factor that we're going to see is subnational uh, response uh, to changing uh, uh, divisions of labor, uh, and in this sense, you know, quite quite productive. I think it may 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 represent the first glimpse of a of a kind of new uh, division of labor as the defense budget uh, uh, shrinks. When you look at regional development, though, there's always the question of how much of the motivation is basically, you know, uh, zero sum game type, where where parts of the country are looking for additional federal funding, ultimately at the expense of all the taxpayers. So certainly, given the, the interest of local politicians, it's got to be part of what's going on. At the same time, I'm not I'm not really trying to disagree with what you're saying because uh, technological change and innovation are ultimately local events involve networking among different groups, private sector, universities, you know, defense and so on. So it has to happen somewhere. So I, I, I think I agree with you that, that this is just an example of, of the positive spillovers of uh, defense spending uh, R&D. But again, as we try to evaluate these types of projects, we have to take into account sort of the regional benefits vis-a-vis -vis the national benefits. Not always the same. I find healthiest there, in fact, uh, <coughs> You know the desire to diversify in the movement mm -hmm. to identify commercial adjacent opportunities. Uh, I mean, clearly there's a dimension of defending the base that is legitimate. I think or expectable, but I think the the accent in Colorado seems to be on diversification, and I and we see this all across the you know in many of these places with you know six percent plus. Uh, shares of the economy in, in defense are looking at it that way, I think. Excellent. Okay. Well, let's go to you. Please wait for a microphone. Um, I will uh, we'll go up here, a woman in the green shirt first, and then we'll do a little bit of this uh, third row, uh, just for a second. And uh, please identify yourself, and please just ask one question, if you could, so we make sure we have enough time. Thank you so much. Jennifer Chen, reporter with Shenzhen Media Group, one of TV network in China. Uh, I have questions with um, um, uh, to Mr. Bernanke. So, do you think the uh, it's about maybe uh, devaluation? So, do you think the China's move to devalue its currency is going to uh, uh, exacerbate the U.S. trade deficit? And is there any any negative impact to U.S. economy? And will it lead to the Fed to raise the interest rates? Uh, also, do you think the floating of the exchange rate of RMB will do any help for uh, for it to join the SDR? Thank you so much. Before I give the floor to Ben, I'm going to say one thing I should have said sooner about ground rules, which is that I'm going to try to protect my colleague in any question he doesn't want to answer because it's not directly pertinent to today's topic and or it might be relevant to his book yeah. launch. We're going, to him, we're going to give him the right to defer. But having said that, yeah. um, well, you're Thanks. confusing me with the chairman of the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, certainly. I mean, I'll just say that um, you know, in, in some sense, what China is doing is what we've asked them to do, which is to let more market forces play a role in determining the value of the currency, and that's we're seeing. The, the Chinese currency appreciated very considerably because of its being tied to the dollar, and that put pressure on, on Chinese economy. So um, this, this is a liberalization that is actually moving in the direction of more market uh, determination of the exchange rate, which is something that the U.S. has actually asked for for a long time. Next question here. Say well, please. We're at Penn State University. Mark, in your findings, what impact have universities had on the overall growth of the economies in these high-tech industries such as aerospace? And what have you found is the best way to leverage the skills and talent at universities to contribute to the national defense and overall economic growth? Yeah, great, great question. And, and I let me provi uh, pri provide one note of prehistory, uh, which is that to an extent, uh, in, in a number of circumstances, 
uh, the military has actually created uh, university departments, for instance, of uh, in, in computer science, for instance, or invested in building uh, the high-level academic knowledge. So that has been another uh, beneficiary, beneficial uh, set of activities uh, in this ongoing uh, interaction between, I think, uh, big government in the form of. Uh, uh, the military and you know, private universities, public universities. So absolutely crucial, uh, clearly in building the skill sets and and creating much of the IP that has uh, fueled this uh, system. Um, yeah, I think it's absolutely crucial. I think that that has been a continued dynamic and, and we see uh, the, the interaction also between uh, defense early purchasing and early program development has been also a way of employing uh, people coming out of the universities. So I think you get these dynamic local ecosystems uh, that as a, almost as a side product create these advanced industry uh, uh, ecosystems as well. We, we routinely, um, when they rate the top universities in the world, the U.S. routinely gets like sure. three quarters of the top 25 or so. It's a huge national asset that we need to make sure we're making best use of. And we've become, by the way, we've become much better at um, interacting between uh, universities oh. and the private sector and government. Yes. That's that's become a, a much uh, a much more efficient process in the United States, and that's that's something we should you know take advantage of. I think the military history has been important in yes working out uh, those patterns, and you know, and I think that's now becoming a standard way of operating. Stay in the third row, one more note. Diversify. Thank you so much, uh, I'm Yasser Al Fakharani, uh, ICFJ fellow. Uh, concern, uh, my question to Mr. Ben: uh, To what extent do you think the uh, Middle East uh, situation, the Middle East and also Africa, you know, uh, ISIL and Boko Haram and these groups, uh, to what extent do you think they have affected already the uh, defense spending and military uh, uh, budget uh, of the United States? Thank you. Well, I'm going to ask you to jump in on this, yeah. Mike, because uh, Mike's done great work on trying to evaluate specific threats and specific uh, objectives of the military and pointing out that you need different types of capacities for different situations. Yeah. I mean, one of the things, and I'm speaking totally as an amateur here, but one of the obvious things about warfare uh, in the last few decades is how little of it is sort of between large national armies and how much of it is sort of symmetric warfare of various kinds uh, dealing with um, lack of information and, and embedded uh, guerrillas and all those sorts of things. And obviously, it's, uh, there was a story this morning about how the U.S. is getting to use much more drone monitoring, for example. So the, the set of technologies that you're using and the set of uh, military strategies obviously has to adapt to the nature of the challenge, and we're seeing a lot, a lot of change there. Uh, Mike? I'll add two points. Um, one of them about economics, so I may need to be corrected here in a moment, but the, but the economics observation is if you had told me 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you could have this much turmoil in the Middle East and oil prices would have taken a dive and sustained that, I would have been flummoxed. And I would have said, well, Professor Bernanke, what is it about your course that I didn't study? <laughs> There's something going on here that I did not know how to predict. So that's one observation, which it, obviously we know some of the answers, but I'm still stunned that this could be true. But secondly, I'm also somewhat surprised that so far we really haven't changed our defense posture very much. So the defense budget cuts have continued. The drawdown in the force has continued, very modestly in the size of the force, but it's still been in the downward direction. And certainly uh, General Odierno, who retired last week as uh, Army Chief of Staff, lamented to some extent the degree to which the Army is suffering the brunt of these reductions, and that hasn't changed in official planning uh, since the rise of ISIL. I think your question was primarily about the last year to two years and the dynamics we've seen. So that would be a second point. My, my third and final point is, however, pushing somewhat in the other direction, is that I would expect, um, Rand Paul and Bernie Sanders notwithstanding, that most of the political energy in the next year and a quarter in the presidential election is going to be to push to the right in defense terms, and that we will see major candidates of both parties advocating at least modest increases in defense spending, uh, uh, recognizing that threats have gone up a bit, and we haven't even talked about Russia and Ukraine. And that, as uh, Chairman Bernanke just said, we don't have to be so rushed 
in our concern about bringing down the deficit as to ignore what might be needed for broader national security purposes. Now, I'm not suggesting we're going to have uh, a 2015 or 2017 equivalent of the Reagan buildup, but I think we will see modest real go growth proposed by either party's presidential candidate once we get through it. The next six weeks are interesting in Washington because of the looming sequester. And, uh, and frankly, I'm a little surprised that, um, that there hasn't been a better effort by the two branches of government responsible for this to make sure we don't sequester defense at this juncture. I think it would be a big, big mistake. Uh, and so here's a plea from a think tank guy to, uh, to please find a way to avoid sequester because we don't need it and it would be counterproductive for the kind of issues you're raising. Over here in the third row. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Michael, Mark, uh, Chairman Bernanke, thank you for your time. I'm Tom Risen with U.S. News World Report. I like what you said about how the government is not too good at uh, uncertain investments over time. I've uh, spoken to some people uh, who um, are um, in the startup community who are unhappy with the federal procurement process. Uh, how do you think that we could make the, make the defense spending better for, uh, to, to fund promising projects quicker and make sure that uh, prom um, projects don't continue longer than they need to? Because startups have a very short life uh, lifetime. They need money really fast. The federal procurement process can take too long for them. How do you think we can improve the federal procurement process to be more like a startup model? I think, um, I don't really know the answer to the question, but I, I, will, <laughs> I will try to answer the following. Um, you were asking me before about the linkage, the, the, the parallels between the Defense Department and the Federal Reserve, and one of them, <laughs> if I may, is one of them is that you know the, the Fed is also engaged in a technologically, technically complex activity with long-run implications, the same as the Pentagon in that respect. And the way, the way the Fed has managed its relationship with Congress is that, uh, at least ideally, the Fed is what's called instrument independent, which means that it gets its gets to make the decisions about how its objectives are met. However, the Congress sets the objectives. Congress ideally does not interfere, for example, in interest rate policy directly, but it says, well, we're, we're charging you, the Fed, with achieving maximum employment and price stability. And so the Fed has to explain how it's going to achieve those objectives, but it, it uses its technical knowledge and its long-term perspective to achieve that. Now, we can't use the same model for, I don't want to pretend that you can use the same model for defense. The, the, the objectives are much more complicated, they're much more harder, harder to evaluate, there's much less short-run feedback from defense. So you can't really say to the Pentagon, here, here we want you to defend America and you decide how to do it. We can't do that, obviously. But uh, I think you could move in the direction of, of Congress and its oversight bodies uh, specifying uh, the particular objectives and goals and capacities that it wants the military to have and giving more scope to either the military itself or, or uh, impartial found, uh, commissions or other groups to sort of make some of those decisions so that so that you're not having politically determined base locations and politically determined procurement decisions of those things. I, I'm not naive enough to think we're going to get all the way there, but we could move in the direction, like the Base Closing Commission is a good example of having more independent um, objective analysis uh, that is then subject to sort of an up or down vote or a single decision by the Congress. And uh, so in, in what you're describing, again, if there was more flexibility to the military planners to meet their objectives, you know, subject to fiscal constraints and so on, that there would be more opportunity for them to, to, to have that flexibility that otherwise too much intervention in those decisions is, is, is blocking. I, I just jumped in. Um, one, one uh, I mean, first there are hints in the fact that these are mission-oriented agencies that may provide uh, a hint towards where this could go with much more uh, uh, focus on actual delivered capabilities, I think, such as uh, Ben is talking about. I would also note that within the defense uh, Corpus, there have been successful experiments, sometimes famous ones, for instance, DARPA, more recently, InQtel, that you know the CIA's uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of venture you know effort that actually do do this that have short applications, quick grant cycles, and are built on speed, and in fact have wound up you know influencing other agencies and the private sector even. So you know I think to 
so much has been spent, so much has been attempted in the military history that that's, to some extent the answers are within the military system as well, you know. And as, I'll have a word here as well. You know it's a complex subject and the answer is going to vary in a way from what type of technology you're talking about one to another. We had an event on acquisition reform for the Department of Defense at Brookings in April and Frank Kendall spoke. He's the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition. And uh, I asked him, how well do you think we're doing in acquisition? Now he's got an incentive to say we're doing okay. On the other hand, he's put out three successive better buying power roadmaps for how we can improve and he's trying to energize the case for reform. But he basically said, I think we're, we're sort of a B plus, because look at it this way, whenever we go to war, we got the best stuff in the world. But then after him, we had Bill Lynn come up on stage, and I asked Bill the same question. Bill had been the Deputy Secretary of Defense, also in the Obama administration. So they're teammates uh, in, in some broader sense. But, but uh, Bill now runs a small uh, company, Finn Mechanica, the US arm of the Italian aerospace company. And Bill said, uh, I think we're pretty good at the big stuff like Secretary Kendall said, and the cost overruns and the delays are sometimes, you know, unfortunate, but you produce a great system in the end, but we're bad at anything that's touched by Moore's Law, anything concerning electronics. So the very kinds of things that are on your mind when you're asking that question, those specific technologies is where Bill thinks we need to find better ways, and there already is legal code that allows you to use some commercial uh, procurement practices, but we don't do it very often. The military services tend to get very conservative in these kind of situations. So anyway, there's a, a million dimensions to the problem and a, and a million answers, but I would just begin by saying some parts of the problem are more serious than others. The overall system is not fundamentally broken. There are parts of it that are broken, in my, in my judgment. Uh, way over here on the far side, please. Bernstein, Sputnik International News for uh, Dr. Bernanke. It's been said that the U.S. ability to project power is very closely linked to economic power. So in your view, at what point does the debt become such an issue that it actually impacts U.S. ability to project power abroad? You said the debt? So you, U.S. debt? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, so I, I said earlier that I didn't think that um, it was right to distort uh, near-term military planning or defense planning because of the deficit, because it's, the deficit is a longer-term issue and debt is a longer-term issue. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, in the long run, to a first approximation, whatever, you know, whatever additional spending we do, we have to pay for somehow and essentially with higher taxes at the end. Um, and clearly with a higher debt to GDP ratio, our resources are, are more constrained than they used to be. So uh, I don't have, I, I can't give you a number which says that beyond a certain, uh, it, there's, there's a, a very sorry history of trying to pick specific numbers where things will go wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't really work. But uh, I certainly didn't mean to imply that we, in the end we don't have to think about uh, our long run national capacity and our resources. And and uh, again, I don't think we're at that point now. I don't think that we should be distorting near-term decisions, but uh, we, we do need to think about over a period of decades, you know, what objectives we have as a country, both foreign policy and military objectives, and uh, understand that, that those things are constrained by our um, economic power. It's a very complicated relationship between uh, economic uh, growth and the military. We've been talking about some of the positive relationships, but we also know the, the work on rise and fall of great powers, which suggests beyond a certain point you can become overextended and the commitment of resources to military purposes can actually be uh, uh, very negative for your economy me in your long run ability to project power. So uh, what I'm trying to say is short run I think we're fine but over the longer term we do have to think about the resource constraints in our economy and make sure that we're not undertaking uh, commitments globally militarily that our economy can't sustain in the long term. If I, could, could I build on that by asking Ben about uh, how you looked at things in the crunch period around you know 
2008, 9, 10. And to what extent was this question on your mind? I mean, obviously, your main concern, I think, was to prevent the Great Recession from becoming the second Great Depression. And you were a firefighter in some ways, and you were trying to find creative ways to save the economy. I don't know if you were thinking in terms of long-term American national power, but in our political science and foreign policy worlds, a lot of people were, at that moment, writing about how China was perceived to be rising, and the perception was growing even faster, perhaps, than the reality, partly because of the Great Recession. To what extent did any of those thoughts enter into your calculus back then? Well, I was certainly thinking about both the short term and the long term. And certainly one of the reasons that we had so much doubt, and I think there still is in the political arena a lot of doubt and, and uh, uh, angst, uh, was because we didn't really know in 2008, 2009, we didn't know exactly how things were going to come out. We didn't know whether this was just a bad recession or something much deeper and longer. So obviously there was a lot of questioning about what our long run capacity was going to be. Um, and what we've seen is that a lot, not all, but a lot of the decline in output we saw uh, after the financial crisis was uh, cyclical. That is, there's been significant recovery, not complete, but significant recovery in, in output and employment. Um, and so the, uh, the, the longer run implications are, I think, less you know, than we were worried about in, in 2000, 2008. In particular, one point I did make very consistently in actual real time was that notwithstanding the scary deficit numbers that we were seeing, and there were 10% of GDP is a very big deficit, which some, we were close to, close to that early on, uh, notwithstanding those scary numbers, I didn't think, as I said at the time, I didn't think that 2008, 2009, 2010 was the right time to be going into fiscal austerity, that we needed to be thinking about long run uh, fiscal constraints, but in the short run we needed to uh, give the economy a chance to recover before we started cutting. And so uh, in the short run, uh, my my advice to Congress at the time was, you know, let's let the economy recover, let's not go into austerity mode yet, but obviously we did, at the same time that we're thinking about uh, recovery and the contribution of fiscal policy to re recovery, um, we also need to be thinking about the long run constraints that we're facing and that's the right trade-off, I thought, at the time. Right. Well, we've got a couple more uh, rounds here. I think I'm going to take two at a time now so we can make sure we get a few more questions in before we run out of time. So why don't we do uh, uh, this gentleman here and then in, in the black shirt in the fourth row and then we'll respond to those together. There's been a recent push. Name, please. Uh, Brian Dolk. There's been a recent push in the fast food industry to raise the minimum wage to $15. It would give a full-time employee a gross pay of about $30,000 a year. In contrast, in the military, a newly minted officer with a college education earns in the low 30,000s, and a new uh, enlisted military personnel is about 18,000. Would you discuss how that raise in minimum wage would impact the military uh, costs, especially with 1.4 million active duty personnel? And then take this question here as well, please. Yeah, name's John Taminsky. Can you talk about the consolidation in the defense industries and whether you think that's on balance good, or does that consolidation lead to mega products that have a life of their own? and just the economies of scale that would bring, and, and how do you actually politically address those? I want to take whichever fraction, and I'll try to... Well, on the, on the uh, minimum wage, um, how much that minimum wage constrains demand for labor depends a lot on the local conditions. I mean, wages are different in different parts of the country. In some parts of the country, that wouldn't be very far from low, what low-paid workers do get. Other parts of the country, that would be very high. It would be probably would squeeze some workers out of the out of the out of, out of the uh, out of employment um, so obviously the uh, military has to maintain competitive wages I haven't done the study I can't give you the exact numbers but my impression is that uh, military pay is, is pretty competitive that uh, that the military is able to attract on average pretty good quality right. uh, recruits and and relatively skilled um, workers so um, I, I would turn to my colleagues on this one, but it's not my impression at this point that um, uh, labor market constraints are preventing the military from um, 
meeting its, its, its needs, and I, I don't think that some increase in minimum wage, whatever the benefits or costs of that, and I'm not going to address that broader question, I don't think that would be a, a major concern, and of course, if necessary, the military can make adjustments. Right. That's right. If right. you, um, there's a quadrennial review of military compensation you're probably familiar with that uh, comes out every four years, and the last one looked across various strata of uh, the defense demographic, and what it basically found is if you compare the typical person in uniform to a person of the same age and experience, educational level, test proficiency in the private sector, military pay for enlisted personnel is at about the 85th percentile. In other words, they make 85% more than, or more than 85% of all people of similar cohort. And that includes their allowance for housing and their health care benefits. Does not include military pension into the calculation. Uh, it's not to say they make enough. That's a separate ethical and moral question as to whether we're doing enough for them when we send them off to war. But in terms of how we're handling the labor market, so far it's been okay. But you raise a good point. Hypothetically, if we go to a higher minimum wage and the economic recovery that Chairman Bernanke and others have engendered continues, you may have some recruiting issues that in recent years we really haven't. So we have to keep our eye on that very carefully. Uh, do you want to try the defense industry consolidation question or Mark? Oh, Mark, that's Mark's question. <laughs> the, uh, I, mean, I can say that one th we've certainly seen that, uh, again, there will be a calculus between places and uh, you'll see consolidation into certain places that will, uh, at a geographical level, that will profit from this and others not. But I think the larger question is the structure of the economies and, and industry that it, it is, exists to deliver you know, mission critical uh, 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 products. And I think you know, the question is about maintaining sufficient competitiveness, I think. Uh, you know, uh, and there has been a lot of uh, consolidation already, I think uh, Mike can talk about, but uh, you know, the question is what is the right spot? Yeah, I think it's sector by sector. You know, we're down to five or six major shipyards. That's probably okay, but it's not five or six separate independent companies. Uh, we've got basically two companies making fighter jets, two companies making fighter jet engines. Um, there's a, a single consolidated production line now, or, or single effort associated with uh, nuclear propelled uh, submarines and aircraft carriers. Some of the work is shared across two different shipyards in two different states. Um, so sector by sector, we usually have a couple, but that's not true in every domain. And we've got a big decision looming in coming weeks or months, which is about the long-range bomber. And as you probably know, there are two main competitors, and, uh, and Boeing and Lockheed are involved in one, and Northrop in the other. Boeing and Lockheed are the two companies making a lot of fighter jets still today, and making other kinds of aircraft as well. Uh, Northrop Grumman makes a lot of drones, but their fate as a future manned aerospace company probably hinges to a large extent in the balance of who wins this competition. Uh, do we, how would we feel if we lost Northrop, hypothetically, in that space? Uh, I would be somewhat concerned. So I think that's the kind of place where you go for from two to one or even three to two where you've got to ask yourself hard questions and maybe you are willing to pay a little bit of a premium in terms of having two separate production lines to retain the independent design and production capabilities if you can find a reasonably economical way to do it. Now with aircraft carriers we don't do that because it's just too much so there's only one place we build them in Virginia and that's it for the country and we just have to hope that Newport News Shipbuilding continues to deliver well uh, but you know I have to say they do deliver well but the new carrier costs two and a half times what the old carrier does, and I'm a little troubled by that trend. So this is where you do worry about losing some competition, and uh, I think your question's right on the money. The problem is there's no perfect answer, and as we continue to have defense budgets stay about the same or shrink a little, and the average cost per weapon keeps going up because of high technology, you're going to have more and more of these decisions to make. So the next one is the long-range uh, strike bomber, and um, uh, again, I'm still sorting through the economics and the national security dimensions of that. Let's go in the back here next to the camera, please. Yes, hi. Uh, Creighton Jones, Future Science Foundation. Uh, so my question is, getting back to this topic of bridging the relationship between the defense and the civilian economy, um, what do you think of the prospects of, while maintaining the inputs that we get from defense and R&D and manufacturing, bringing more of that, the final expenditure of that activity domestically, such as through expanding the role of the Army Corps of Engineers in terms of size and scope, 
or creating programs for returning soldiers to engage in actual nation building types of activity such that you sort of start to close that cycle of import of you know input and output but it actually the final product is expended here in the United States itself you know close in particular the multi-trillion dollar infrastructure gap that we currently have let's take one more question before we go to responses here so um, yeah I will go in, in the back gentleman in the, in the tie with his hand up here comes the microphone I appreciate all your comments so far. I noticed the principle of draconian measures in case the, the budget balance gets to be a very serious issue with the GDP, which may occur. Uh, I wonder, there's a problem with the sequester, as we heard following that, that that's a problem. Now, what, what to do? In 1939, FDR was faced with a problem with Britain and the situation in Europe, and they told Britain, we'll give you what you want, but this principle is cash and carry. By January 41, they were out of money, and we moved into Lend-Lease. Currently, we just merely provide a great deal of weapons to countries and don't charge them a thing. Uh, I wonder how long can this keep up? Is this the right way to proceed? Why don't we take one last question and make it the final round, uh, and then we'll maybe divvy things up one by one. <laughs> Sir, here in the, in the white shirt. Yes, hi, Graham Vise with Inside Sources. Uh, you had spoke earlier about the sort of implications of all of this for labor and for workers. Uh, you talked about, um, you know, the, the debates over how much uh, the training actually benefits uh, workers. And, and um, I'm just curious, as you look sort of long term um, and you consider the uh, maybe cutbacks or, or maybe future increases in the defense budget and defense spending, what uh, other sort of implications does that have for workers, for the sort of um, quality of of, of jobs for low-skilled folks, for, for the higher-skilled folks, and then maybe, uh, you know, we're talking about different metro areas, what are the sort of differences in different parts of the country uh, in, terms of, in terms of that issue? If you like, I can try to begin with the first two questions and then pass yeah. you guys to conclude with whatever other comments. Go for it. Uh, so, so on the first two questions, um, very fair points, but I would point out that in broad terms, we're already doing pretty well by the standards that you identified. In other words, American defense manufacturing is largely an export-oriented sector. They do export a, a, a fair number of weapons abroad. Most of the money in the defense budget is spent by and for American firms. Most of it is spent in the United States. We've downsized overseas bases just as dramatically, actually more so than we have domestic bases. So there's always room to look at another example and say we could do better here. But we also have to maintain uh, a, a sense of fair trade because we are trying to continue to persuade overseas customers to buy our stuff and if we never think about buying theirs um, you know it's, it's hard to maintain the culture that says we should be open and fair so overall I'm less concerned perhaps about the broad picture than, than you might be uh, and, I, and I do think defense trade is an advantage for the American economy right now we do more exporting than we do importing and on this issue sir uh, related question of uh, where we're giving away weapons you know it, you could, there are some good debates to be had but they only concern three or four important countries three or four big chunks of money. So we're giving a lot of security assistance to Egypt. Myself, I think it's too much because I don't want to support President Sisi quite as categorically as we are, but it's not so much for the reason you mentioned. That's a fair debate. But And then we have, of course, Afghanistan, where we essentially fund their army and police, and we're going to have to keep doing that for a number of years. Not so much high technology weaponry, more salaries, although a little bit of both. We give a lot of uh, ongoing help to, to Israel, but Israel makes its own decisions about where to buy weapons and often makes its own weapons. Uh, and the Gulf states in the Middle East, they buy weapons with the money that you know they earn from the oil economy. Same thing for East Asian partners. Same thing for uh, European allies with other, uh, obviously they all make their own uh, uh, revenues in different ways, but they're all capable of paying and they tend to pay. So you can have good debates about, from a foreign policy point of view, should we be giving as much money to Afghanistan, to Egypt, uh, to Israel, to some extent to Iraq, although we're not giving very much right now. Uh, but I don't think it's fundamentally a big problem about most of our defense uh, exports depending on the taxpayer largesse. Defense industry is competitive. American defense industry is competitive, and it's winning a lot of contracts with paying customers, again, largely in the Middle East, East Asia, and Europe uh, already today. I'll leave my answers at that. Ben, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just in the last one about, about cutbacks, um, 
again, uh, going back to the question about the debt and so on, I mean, having a large military is a, a, an economic burden, ultimately, for the most part. I mean, it uses up resources that, and tax money that could otherwise be used. But to the extent it has benefits, I mean, one, one of the ones I think we've identified today is the, on the technological spillovers and productivity spillovers. And in particular, as Mark was, was uh, pointing out, that the uh, it seems politically, unfortunately, seems easier to get some of these things funded and supported via in the context of defense spending than it would be in, in a more general, you know, civilian context. Uh, so I think that's that's an important consideration. We want to make sure that we remain um, technically and uh, technologically competitive, and that does affect. It affects different workers differently, of course, but uh, it does affect the overall prosperity of our economy, and uh, ultimately it affects, I think, most workers, um, the ability of our country to uh, produce uh, at a high level and with high productivity. So I think that's the main thing that I feel a little bit uncomfortable about, because I, I, it's, it's, we, we are, in fact, um, we are, in fact, reducing our reliance on federal and defense-oriented R&D in the sense that that's been coming down as a share of total R&D. But uh, there is a good economic case for um, government support for basic research and research with broad-based spillovers to the extent that cutbacks in military mean cutbacks in that kind of research as well. I think that's uh, something to be concerned about. Uh, I'll throw in, in, on a parallel uh, basis, uh, I, I, the military clearly anchored the creation of the sort of space line STEM workforce in this country. And we're clearly seeing the shrinkage of that, the aging of that in, in many of the uh, defense industries and in the services. So I think parallel to what Ben is saying, I've been saying there's also the transition in our training posture, both for the military and the rest of the economy. And again, I think uh, we've not been arguing for a certain size of the military, but we have been arguing for a competitiveness of the nation, both on the military side, but also economically. So I think you see that that's a huge question if, as you're hearing in the innovation space, but also in skills, and then the defense manufacturing base, which I think we're seeing there, uh, a, the technology side is now, I think, lifted the, the, the uh, uh, manufacturing base to an extent where it is now much more competitive than it was, even though it is not hiring and to the same extent. So I think there's a real transition here that's about the trend for, for uh, the defense budget, but then what about the rest of the budget and or are there other sources for uh, delivering these services that we are needed, that we can uh, leverage. So, yeah. Unless there are any final yeah. words, I think we'll uh, recognize there are a lot more topics to explore. Yeah. We haven't come up with an industrial policy for solving the Washington Nationals <laughs> decline, among other topics. So please stay tuned. We have a full agenda coming up in the fall, including, of course, Ben's book. But thank you all very much for being here.